Thank you so much, uh, Renata, and I, I want to thank you uh, for moderating this evening's really stimulating lecture. I'm going to introduce it in a moment, but I have some thank yous first. I want to thank Yasmina Lukic and the Gender Studies Department for uh, co-hosting this along with Legal Studies and Hershey. I think we probably have some Hershey uh, participants in the audience. Uh, so you can see Judge Gertner uh, seated to my left, and I will now introduce her. Uh, but I'm delighted that she's on this snowy night drawn such a, a large uh, audience. And I don't think you're going to be in the least bit disappointed. You'll be very pleased. Um, I want to start my introduction, and it won't be long, but I, I will start it by saying about 40 years ago, it shows you how long it might be if I bring it all the way from there to the date, uh, I uh, was a student at uh, the Yale Law School, and one day I met uh, another student at the Yale Law School who was a very dynamic person, somewhat shorter than I was, uh, and still shorter than I am. Uh, and she had acquired a reputation which I soon found to be absolutely true uh, for being fearless in the classroom, in challenging some of the most brilliant and prickly professors, and there were quite a few of them at the Yale Law School. Law schools tend to produce uh, challenging and prickly professors. And she showed courage that very few of us, uh, her fellow law students, had. Uh, in uh, managing this uh, very complicated intellectual environment at the Yale Law School. And I have to say, uh, over the 40 years that I've watched her since then, uh, Nancy Gertner, now Judge Gertner, has continued to be very much in line with that uh, very uh, stimulating and inspiring law student who I met uh, 40 years ago. She's really at the forefront, uh, and you will soon hear, of the ongoing daily struggle which goes on in every country. It's certainly going on here in Hungary and in Central Europe, the struggle for justice. The struggle for justice in America is a difficult struggle as well and has had rocky and difficult times over many years. I think we all know that at times of economic and political stress, justice is often forced to take a back seat. At times when issues of security and crime control dominate democracy and democratic societies, justice is pushed to the back of the bus, as we Americans would say, about what happened to injustice of African Americans over so many years. But I would say not in the courtroom of Judge Nancy Gertner and not in the distinguished legal career of Nancy Gertner, the lawyer, where justice has always been in the forefront and has never been pushed to the back. She's really one of the most courageous judges in America. She has time and again stood up against racism, and there is plenty of evidence of racism in American democratic society. She has stood up against gender discrimination under circumstances where others would say, go slow. She has stood up against the abuse of civil liberties. And perhaps most importantly, she's constantly stood up against the abuse of power. Uh, the abuse of power in a democratic society can often be a particularly challenging issue to stand up against. And if you were a federal judge, uh, taking a strong stand is a particularly challenging thing to do. She's done this against the prevailing winds of judicial and political caution, which we've seen in the United States, and I think we see in many parts of the world today, against those who have said, yes, there's a time for justice, but not now. Not now because the issues of terrorism or the issues of security or the issues of crime control or whatever other issues are more important than standing up against uh, justice. And sometimes people will even say, no, the case is too complex. There are too many different aspects, too many different sides, and therefore it's difficult to find the path to justice. But our speaker tonight has certainly time and again shown that. Um, 
She uh, and her husband, who's uh, not able to be here this evening but has visited the Hungarian Civil Liberties Union today, her husband is one of the foremost civil liberties lawyers in America, uh, have fought for justice and the rule of law for many years. And I think one thing that you should know as I introduce Judge Gertner is that she's a deeply practical person as well as a principled person, which is she, can, she has found the way to make, uh, make justice come alive in a situation that might be uh, very complicated. Let me just give you a few highlights of her uh, career. Um, she was a classmate of mine, as I've said, a classmate of somebody much more famous, uh, Bill Clinton, who was at the Yale Law School together with her. And not surprisingly, uh, many years later, uh, he recognized her talents and, and uh, nominated her for a position on the uh, US uh, federal judiciary. But she spent the first part of her career as a trial lawyer and a civil rights lawyer in Boston defending uh, civil rights and civil liberties. She had many difficult clients, um, difficult in the sense that civil liberties often don't necessarily go with the uh, produce the best clients in, in a courtroom. For example, uh, she had a woman activist who was accused of being a bank robber, and she successfully uh, defended her. She had an alleged uh, drug dealer who was accused of growing the drugs on his own farm in western Massachusetts, and I think that was a particularly challenging case for her to take on on civil liberties. Um, she's had a number of path-breaking cases on the federal bench uh, in, the, in the U.S. District Court for the District of Massachusetts. She issued the first ruling against racial profiling by the police, which can be one of the most insidious ways of discriminating against whole classes uh, of people. She issued a ruling requiring the elimination of racially discriminatory methods for choosing juries. And of course, the jury system, at least in our uh, and the American system is, is at the heart of whether or not you're going to have a fair trial. She had a very interesting ruling uh, last year where she forced the courts to re-examine the high penalties uh, against the downloading of copyrighted materials, recognizing that there is, in fact, a right, a copyright, but there's also a right, and it should be a proportionally recognized right for information to become uh, available. She's had a distinguished career as a visiting professor at Yale and, and Harvard Law School. She's been an international lecturer on issues of justice and judicial practice uh, here in Central and Eastern Europe, in China, in Turkey, Israel, Cambodia, Vietnam, Liberia. Um, and her leadership in judicial areas was recognized by one of the highest awards given in the United States to uh, federal judges, and that is the Thurgood Marshall Award, named after the, the great American jurist uh, Thurgood Marshall, the only other woman ever to see, receive that award, uh, apart from Judge Gertner, was Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg of the US Supreme Court today. So next spring, uh, Judge Gertner will publish her memoirs, and the title uh, sums up perfectly her extraordinary career, In Defense of Women, Memoirs of an Unrepentant Advocate. So let me present to you a judge who is an unrepentant human rights advocate. <laughs> the, the problem with an introduction like that is that at its conclusion, I feel wonderfully buoyed and very old. <laughs> Uh, it, is a one, it is a great honor to be here to speak at this great university. This is my second visit to Budapest. My ties go back before that. My maternal grandparents were Hungarian, and if I didn't know it before, I know it every time I enter a traditional Hungarian restaurant, like Proust, if you recall, who tasted a Madeleine and suddenly was flooded with memories. I get transported back to my grandmother's stuffed cabbage and her strudel. So it's wonderfully comfortable to be here. Uh, as John said, um, I've been a judge for the past 17 years. Before that, and this is an unusual career for an American judge, uh, I was a criminal defense and civil rights lawyer. The usual tr career for a judge 
is much less controversial than that. I had a very controversial year, a number of years as a civil rights and criminal defense lawyer. And then at the same time, mixed in, I've also taught and written on criminal law, gender, human rights, and comparative sentencing. And in addition to that, I have three kids. I just want to say that. Important to say. Um, so I come to this issue on many levels. I come as a, as a judge, as an academic, and also as a practitioner. I regard actually the judging part as part of being a practitioner. So I want to talk, this is what I'm supposed to talk about. Oh, it's no longer there. I'm talking about criminal law and gender and race. Let me start abstractly and then let me get more concrete and in particular talk to you about the kinds of things that I've been able to do in these areas. And I don't pretend that my experience can be easily translatable into yours, but I offer the things that I've done just as an example of the kinds of things someone can do. So here's the general principle. Law is supposed to be neutral. It's supposed to be universal. It derives its legitimacy from its universality. State power in a democracy is supposed to come from the universality of its rules, what Weber called legal rational legitimacy. The criminal law, it could not be more important than in the criminal law when state power imprisons, or worse, candidly, in my country, kills the death penalty. Legitimacy is not just backed up by force, it's legitimate insofar as it is neutral and even-handed. In the United States, we call this a government of laws but not of men, a government of laws but not of men. Now, that's an interesting concept. The word men was intended to be, broadly speaking, the universal man. Sadly, for much of American history, it wasn't the universal man. It was man in the sense of white man, and it was man in, the, in opposite to women. Concerns about equality in criminal law are not just an, an abstraction. As one writer noted, the legitimacy of the criminal justice system is essential because that's what encourages law-abiding behavior. If people believe in the basic legitimacy of a leader or a regime or a procedure, they're far more likely to abide by its rules. If the system is seen as corrupt, unfair, or unjust, those who are subjected to it will be less inclined to respect it. Discrimination qualifies as a system that is unjust. Uh, so I'm going to talk about three kinds of injustice in the criminal justice system in the United States, but I don't believe that it's unique to the United States. First is when the law on its face, the law expressly discriminates, the law singles out one group or another for different treatments. But then I want to talk about the more subtle kind of discrimination where the law does something not directly but indirectly by criminalizing some kind of behavior that disproportionately affects one part of the population or another. And then I want to talk about a situation where the law does neither. In fact, the law is perfectly formally equal, doesn't single out one group for a disproportionate impact, but it is enforced unequally. That's racial profiling, the unequal treatment of women. And then I want to talk about what you do about these things, or at least what I did about them. So again, one caveat, my narratives start with my country, but that's only because that's a starting point. The things that I'm talking about, I think, are the problems of any majority government in dealing with any minority, and governments, obviously, in dealing with women. So starting off with race. This is now, broadly speaking, when the law formally discriminates. You all know the history of the United States. There was a time when American law reflected our national tragedy, which was slavery. And laws embodied slavery, laws enforced slavery, laws were what made slavery work. And even when slavery was eliminated, the law still embodied those racist concepts. It took decades for race to be taken out of American law. And in its place, we had laws with racially disparate impact. They were not necessarily laws that were intended to hurt black people but they were laws that had that effect. And I want to bring up to date one of them today. We, we have a law, we, we all have drug laws. Drug war is international. In the United States, we had two different kinds of laws dealing with cocaine. There was law dealing with powder cocaine and laws dealing with crack. Uh, 
Crack was a cheap, addictive version of powder cocaine, and it was thought at the beginning far more dangerous. So the legislature, American Congress, passed a law making crack punishable 100 times more severely than powder. No one did it for the purposes of hurting black people. No one did it for the purposes of, for racist purposes. But the effect was extraordinary. Crack was the drug of the ghetto. And whatever the original intention had been, by 2010, by now, African Americans are 13% of the general population, but 50% of the prison population. As one writer put it, one out of three black men born today in the United States can expect to spend some time in jail during his lifetime. What are the unintended consequences of a law that may have legitimate reasons at the beginning, but an extraordinary disproportionate impact? Well, it enhanced a racist narrative, the public identification of black people with crime. And taking black people and making them seem as criminals, it was not a civil rights issue anymore. You see, that was, they were outsiders. It was not a civil rights issue. They were not deserving of our attention. What could I do as a judge? I had to enforce these laws. I had to put people away for extraordinary amounts of time. All the while, I was deeply, deeply troubled. Now, a common law judge, unlike judges in Central Europe and, and judges in the civil code country, I have more flexibility. I can write things in my opinions. So I would sentence a man to an extraordinary amount of time, in my judgment, and what I would do is I would say in my public opinion, I can give one example in particular. I sentenced a man who was dealing crack. Yes, he was dealing crack. And he had no uh, obvious means of support. He was dealing crack out of his car. His car wasn't a Rolls Royce. His car was a dysfunctional uh, Ford. He was dealing crack out of his car because he was homeless. And this was his only means of support. And the law made no distinction between someone who was dealing crack out of his car because he was homeless and someone who was dealing crack out of a Rolls Royce. So I sentenced him as the low I could consistent with the law. I have to obey the law. But I wrote, in my opinion, that because of the extraordinary disproportionate severity of this law, I was sentencing this man for crack distribution to the same amount as I would sentence someone for attempted sedition. In other words, the law had gone so far out of control, I couldn't do much about it, but I certainly could contribute to a dialogue. And so I did. And other judges around the country began to talk about it as well. Uh, I, as I was coming in here, someone, I was reminded of the fact that briefly I blogged. Uh, if you Google me, somehow this comes right up that I blogged. Uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the Boston Globe wrote an article about how, you know, you picture most bloggers in their pajamas at their computer, and there I was blogging in my robes. You know, it made a great, it was a great, very, very controversial, but I blogged about the disparity between crack and cocaine and the racial issues involved. Now, I have to say as a footnote here, I have life tenure. I cannot be removed unless I am impeached for improper behavior. My salary cannot be reduced. My assignments are not determined by any president of the court. The assignments are randomly drawn. So even though I'm sure I have mightily pissed off, is the only way to put it, the chief justice of my court, there is nothing he can do about it. And so I therefore say what I think is right. And now, not just because of me but others, We've seen the beginnings of legislative change in the United States just as I was leaving. The, the disparate treatment had begun to crumble. Congress passed different legislation. The sentencing guidelines have changed. The beginning of an understanding that this was a gigantic blunder. So that's law and race, where the law embodied, for good and sufficient reasons, embodied a, an approach that had a disparate impact on blacks. Law and gender is a far more complicated story, most of, most of which I've addressed when I was a lawyer. I want to look at two areas. There are areas where the law applies to women and men equally and shouldn't. Should I say that again? The law applies to women and men equally, as in the law of self-defense, but fail to recognize real differences in gender. Or the opposite, where the law made special categories for women, like rape, 
uh, and fail to recognize the similarities with other crimes. In other words, that rape was violent crime, not any special sexual crime that only women and others could have, but it was violence. So there are two different situations, one where the law treats people the same and really shouldn't, and the other where the law treats, treats people differently, but in fact they were the same. Self-defense. In the United States, and I imagine it's the case all over the world, you have a right to defend yourself with lethal force. And the standards were very strict. You had to be threatened with an imminent bodily harm. You had no alternative, no way out. Uh, and you could only use so much force as was necessary to stop the attack. But we interpreted these concepts, juries did, judges did, with men in mind. Think about it this way. Think of a, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. What he regards as self-defense and what I need for self-defense are two separate things. We characterize self-defense with men in mind, male needs, male strength. For women, the point of threat may be earlier. Violence may appear imminent or require force because of their size, because of their acculturation, their history. Let me give you an example when I was a lawyer. I represented a small woman. She was perhaps uh, 18 or 19. She had been uh, homeless most of her life. She was taken in by an older man who was her patron, and sexual patron as well. One day he was outraged because she was, seemed, to flirt, seemed to be flirting with a younger man. And he was outraged, takes her home. They're in their bedroom. He's at the threshold of the bedroom. She's inside, and he threatens her verbally. He doesn't touch her. He threatens her. He says, I'm going to kill you for what you did this evening. She is tremendously frightened. Given his size and the fact that there's a gun in the cabinet that she knew of, she fully believed he would kill her. She reached for the gun he had in a drawer by the bed, and as he came closer, she emptied the gun into him. In other words, shot him, emptied all the bullets into him. Now, to the prosecutor, the fact she resorted to a gun and the number of shots, everything, numbers of shots, signified that she meant to kill him. This was first-degree murder. To me, I was her lawyer. I wanted to examine what the circumstances were that, under which women used guns and resorted to deadly force. In fact, the study suggested women, she, believed, she was resorting to deadly force because the last thing she believed she could do was to stand up and push him away. If she looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, perhaps she could do that. But because of her size, she couldn't believe that that's what she could do. So one of the studies suggested that women, in fact, resort to guns earlier than men do, precisely because of their physical differences. And why did she empty the gun into him? Well, she, was, she had never used a gun before. She had no idea that one deft shot would take care of him. She emptied the gun because she believed nothing was going to stop him, and that's all that she could do, and she kills him. The issue was, was the test for self-defense the reasonable man test, or would the law allow for a reasonable woman test? A jury might find that it was not reasonable to do what she did, but it had to at least open up the prospect to, to self-defense as that is interpreted by, quote, a reasonable woman. As a lawyer, I brought the expert testimony to court. As an advocate, I made the same explanation to you, to them, as I'm making to you. And over time, numbers of us did this, numbers of women advocates in self-defense cases. And over time, the law began to change so that now the instruction is a reasonable woman instruction, not an idiosyncratic woman. In other words, it's not, you know, you can go around with your Lugers and start shooting every man you know. It has to be within the framework of self-defense. But it's a framework that at least bears in mind the differences between men and women. And this was a breakthrough that was especially important in domestic violence. Women in violent homes had different responses to the violence of their husband. They respond to the threat not because of what the husband is necessarily doing at that moment, but what he did the day before. And they could predict his violence and often did so reliably. The relationship of self-defense self was now filtered through this battering relationship and, and was reflected in something we call battered woman syndrome. I was uh, in my book, which perhaps we'll bring the next time I come. 
uh, I describe uh, uh, representing a woman who uh, brought the first battered woman syndrome defense in Massachusetts. Uh, and it was along these lines where she tried to explain to the jury, and this was at least a framework that enabled her to explain how it would come to pass that she would respond to a threat under circumstances that would be quite different than someone who had never experienced what she had experienced. Now again, I'm not saying that it is justified to do these things, right? Kill people. But the issue is whether the decision maker has to take into account the person in front of them or impose a reasonable man standard. The rape laws were different. The rape laws, to some degree, were idiosyncratic to women. That is to say, the law treated rape differently than all other crime, and it shouldn't have. With rape, it failed to appreciate the similarities between rape and other violent crime. Rape was treated with special leniency in a way that other violent crime was not because of, in my country, our complex attitudes about sex. So for example, it took years to recognize rape in marriage. This was a spillover of the public-private distinction in the law. Marital rape, after all, was seen as private, much like domestic violence was. That has changed. Stranger rape had rules to corroborate that were just unlike any other crime. I dealt with some of this when I was a lawyer. If, some, if you were raped, the, the jury would be told that unless you told someone right away, it could not be rape. It was the concept of fresh complaint and it was medieval. It was the notion that chastity was so important to me that if I were raped, I would run around and tell everyone I knew that I was now, you know, I had been violated. Fact of the matter is women who are raped go home, take a shower, and pretend it didn't happen. So fresh complaint was a standard that no longer matched the realities of women's life. Date rape, as you know, was hardly prosecuted at all. Rape was defined as an act, not of sex without consent, but against her will. And part of that meant that she had to signal her lack of will by violence. She had to resist to the utmost. Every woman of my generation was told, do not resist, you will be killed. And yet the law was embodying a standard that bore no relationship uh, to reality. The law's focus on violence also meant that rape, meant that rape by deception or drugging, all the ways in which sexual assault could be committed without consent were not recognized. And perhaps you all have that here. Her sexual history would be introduced, again, on the theory that once you lost your virginity, uh, you could be raped at will, happily, that no longer applies in the United States. A woman's sexual history is not introduced. That was a legislative change. And when I was a lawyer, I would testify in Congress uh, about these laws. This had to be established legislatively. And we, uh, women's movement in the United States, I suspect across around the world, really lobbied for change in the law to have the law catch up in meaningful ways to what the culture was, uh, to the changes in social norms that were <coughs> swirling around. Now, apart from situations in which the law recognizes a special category when it shouldn't, or when the law has a disparate impact, the crack cocaine issue I'm describing, the most difficult of all is when the laws are perfect, absolutely perfect, do not have a disparate impact on anyone at any time, and are simply not enforced. That's the most difficult thing of all, and some of that we'll be talking about tomorrow. Racial profiling was a classic example. There is a stretch of road in the United States called the New Jersey Turnpike. And we began to describe the New Jersey Turnpike exception to the Constitution. People of color on the New Jersey Turnpike were stopped to in out of proportion to their numbers. Police would see a man of color going up the New Jersey Turnpike, Hispanic or black, and pull the car over if they were doing you know, one mile over the speed limit. Uh, and as the numbers of minorities increased in, mass, in United States jails, the narrative associating blacks and crime uh, became even more clear. Right before I went on the bench, in a case that of all the cases I had was perhaps the most likely to keep me off the bench, I represented uh, the following person. I, there was a, terribly, a terrible crime in Massachusetts. A husband and his pregnant wife were shot. 
She was on her way to a birthing class. She'd come back from a birthing class. The wife was killed, the fetus dies, the man was shot as well. There were two stories one could tell about this event. One was the urban myth story which the man who survived told. I had been shot by a black man, he said. I'd been shot and he shot and killed my wife. He came into the car, he tried to rob us and he shot her and shot me. Miraculously, I survived. That's the story he told. It was the urban myth that fed right into the narratives about black crime. There was another narrative, which those of us with some experience in this field began to think about. That was the narrative of domestic violence. It was, in fact, not unheard of for a man to shoot a woman, uh, his wife, when she's pregnant. It was not unheard of for him to believe that that was a moment when she, he had lost control of their relationship. The police believed only the narrative of the urban myth, only the narrative of black crime. And they tore apart the minority neighborhoods of Boston. Uh, they pressured people to talk to them. They illegally searched. They tore apart the minority neighborhoods because they fully believed in that view. But the other story they ignored. And in writing my book, I actually had an opportunity I'd represented, not the man who did, well, I don't want to tell you the head of the story, but I knew something about this case. And in my book, I found that there was an interview that the police had had with a friend of the man who was shot, the husband. And the friend had told the police, Charles Stewart, that's the name of this man, Charles Stewart shot his wife told a police officer, Charles Stewart shot his wife. He had talked to me before this event. He had asked me to find someone who could shoot his wife. I said, come on, Charles, you're kidding. Then I hear about the wife being shot and Charles being shot, and I believe he did it. He, this man, this witness, talked to a police officer, and because what the police officer heard was inconsistent with his narrative, the information went no further. Can you imagine that? In the investigation, the information went no further, whereas the narrative of black crime went all over the city. But this information went so further. Indeed, the brother of Charles Stewart, who had also reason to believe his brother had done it, had told 20 or 30 people. And none of this made it into the police's hands. None of that reached the police because it was inconsistent with their stereotypes. So racial profiling is more than just stopping people on the street uh, when there's no basis for it. Racial profiling inflict, afflicts investigation, afflicts all aspects of the criminal justice system. It afflicts the charging decision. It afflicts uh, the arrest decision. Those of you who know anything about trials, which I imagine many of you do, it afflicts eyewitness identification. Social psychology suggests that it's very difficult to identify someone of a different race. We think we can. We think we can. I, I, you know, I know this person as if it, it happened yesterday. Indeed, if the person is a different race, we don't know the nuances of cross-racial identification. But bias was particularly troubling in an area that was my particular expertise, which was sentencing. Uh, it was believed we had unlimited, judges had unlimited discretion in sentencing up until a few years ago, about 20 years ago. And it was con there was concern that what that meant was that judges were sentencing minorities, uh, African Americans more strictly, and were sentencing women more leniently. I saw some of this as a judge, as a lawyer rather. Uh, I was once in court and the woman in front of me was a young woman lawyer who had a black uh, defendant with her. And the, his sheet, the sheet that had his criminal history was blank. And the judge looked, and he was accused of a crime, the judge looked down at the blank sheet, looked at the black defendant and said, I don't believe this. She knew nothing, this is a woman judge, knew nothing except the color of the man, and that was it. I don't believe it. She said to the woman lawyer, put your client on the stand and have him swear that he was not, that he didn't have a criminal record. I raced up to the front. I was not involved in this case at all. I missed, I just missed her by a few minutes and she performed as the judge had suggested. 
As a judge, I've seen two different pre-sentence reports, the kind of report we get before we sentence someone. One would say, if X goes to jail, his family will be forced to go on welfare, as if that is a bad thing. I see one that says, if Y goes to jail, it won't be a problem. His family will be taken care of on welfare. The language of the two reports reflected a white defendant and a black defendant. So we knew that any, whenever there's discretionary decision making, there was room for bias. And the concern was to stop this in sentencing with formal rules, rules actually not unlike the rules in, in a civil code country where there were mandatory rules. There were rules that you had to follow uh, to sentence someone and they, and they would try to take all discretion out of the process. So I had a case. Mandatory rule was if there, the crime was worth X amount and the, if you had a certain criminal history it was this amount and when the boxes met you had to sentence in that little box. Alexander Leviner was a man I sentenced. He was arrested for gun possession. He was not a wonderful person, seminary student. He was a criminal. He had been arrested for possession of a gun. His criminal history was very high, and I couldn't figure that out, so I read it. His criminal history was very high. Driving after your license was suspended, town A. Driving after your license was suspended, town B. Driving after your license was suspended, town C. There was no traffic arrest. In other words, he was not a bad driver. A, B, and C were the white suburbs of Boston. And I concluded in this decision, again, life tenure, this was the crime of driving while black. I was going to credit that he had a record for sure. He was going to be punished for the crime, but the punishment was not going to be occasioned by that, was not going to be substantially increased because of that. With women, these mandatory rules had a different impact. To eliminate any discretion, to keep people, judges from exercising discretion, the Congress decided that we wouldn't look at family circumstances. Because family circumstances you know, oftentimes meant that white defendants would do better than black defendants. So family circumstances would not be reviewed. And what that meant, of course, was that for women offenders, a judge couldn't consider her, the fact that she was a single mother. You could only consider that if it was extraordinary, and in the universe of people that I was sentencing was not extraordinary. So let me tell you about another case. Her name was Daise. She was Nigerian-American. She pled guilty to being a drug courier, a mule. She had no criminal record. She was the principal caretaker of two young children and a three-month-old infant whom she was nursing at the time of the sentencing. The district court judge, actually not my case, labored over this. And in particular, how would the infant be nourished while she was in jail? He worried at that time that all three children would receive inadequate attention, perhaps she would lose them. And finally, he decided to go away from the mandatory rules because she had a crime fit in a certain category, even though she was a first offender, she was in this box, and he decided he couldn't send her to jail. Uh, and he would depart from the range that the mandatory code required. It was reversed. The Court of Appeal said nothing about her situation was extraordinary. So I wrote an article, again, life tenure and nobody can mess with me. I wrote an article about the impact of these mandatory rules on women and on the fact that the mandatory rules meant that you couldn't consider the ways in which a woman's crime, in fact, was different than a man's crime. They didn't let you consider the impact of family circumstances. They didn't let you consider the nuances of their role in the offense. The discrimination we saw in the world at large, we saw in crime. Women were really at the bottom. And if the guidelines only let me make a minor adjustment for a minor role, it didn't begin to reflect who they were. And I went on and on. But the net effect of these mandatory rules was to increase the incarceration of women. So to make a, a too long story shorter, I have written, I write in my opinions, I testify, I blog.
Uh, as a lawyer, uh, it was clear to me that this job wasn't worth taking unless I could align my heart and my work. Uh, I'm a workaholic, I, and I spend too much time on all of this uh, not to love what it is I do. So let me return to the first point. Law is only legitimate if it is not just formally neutral, but neutral in its impact and its enforcement. It's only legitimate, uh, and it's only, it will only be obeyed if it's legitimate. Uh, I teach, as, as John mentioned, in China. And in China, what we find when we teach women's rights or race relations in China, we find that the Chinese are tremendously receptive but they think that the issue will be solved once you come up with the perfect law. And we spend hours defining gender violence, sexual harassment, race discrimination, what it is and what it isn't. And once we come up with the perfect definition, they go home. And my career and my life, and I suspect yours as well, suggest to us that the perfect laws are only the beginning of this story. Uh, judicial training, police training, uh, law, training of all sorts of law enforcement, public training is the only way to make the law come alive and be fair. Thank you. Any questions? Look at that. I don't even have to moderate. So <laughs> whoever is I'm a control freak. Well, maybe then I just uh, so please signal if you would like to ask a question, and the microphone has to reach you. And it would be nice if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm Peter Molnar from the Media Studies Center here at CU, and. I wonder what's your view about hate crime laws, that especially that whether they, uh, they provide opportunities for discriminatory practices you just described. Of course, in the US, hate speech laws cannot provide such practices because they don't exist, but there are hate crime laws. So are they similarly problematic in your view in this respect? Are you talking about um, laws that uh, make increased punishment if the motivation were racist? Is that what you're talking about? Yes, yes, and whether those are applied in discriminatory ways that you described. I, I think that the, the, that actually needs to be studied. I don't mean to duck your question, and the reason I say it is for two reasons. One is, on the one hand, uh, enhanced punishment may be the only way to, for us as a society to say this is wrong and categorically wrong. On the other hand, for a prosecutor who has the choice of an enhanced punishment or not, it's an enormous amount of power in the prosecutor's hands. Uh, it, it, in much the same way as some of what I've described here, you know, a prosecutor can charge you with a mandatory minimum statute that will suddenly lead to enhanced penalties or not. So I actually, I don't have a clear answer. It, the criminal law stands as a statement of what we regard as heinous. But by the same token, uh, the, 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 I want to understand the circumstances under which it's used and the context. Uh, in front of the column in the middle. Thank you. I'm Judith Wirt from Nane Women's Rights Association. I'd like to ask you, I, I don't know if you are familiar with this, one of the recent si global signature um, collecting campaigns, which is uh, related to a woman in the US who has been sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Um, the, the original crime was she, um, she killed um, her pimp boyfriend abuser who had abducted her when she was a child basically, some 12 or 14, I don't know exactly, um, and, um, and raped her and then prostituted her and all kinds of horrible crimes and at what one point she, she killed him. And that was many years ago. 
Um, and uh, before uh, Schwarzenegger goes out of, uh, <laughs> of his office, they want him to, pro to give her parole. Um, and there is this global campaign. And I, I wanted to ask you if you see any, um, any chance, any possibility, any hope, um, especially because you spoke about this idea of um, self-defense. And one of, one of the persons who circulated this signature campaign said that she has, um, she, uh, um, she has basically paid society for the crime that she committed. And to my mind, she had paid society when she killed that man because that man could, should have been arrested way before she could kill her, but he wasn't. Um, so my question is basically what, what do you see in such campaigns? Um, the parole system in the United States is not functioning very well because it, it, it has become very political. So a, a governor that wants higher office and maybe Schwarzenegger has gone as high as he can go, I don't know, may be less willing to grant parole. We had a similar situation in Massachusetts though. There were eight women in the women's prison who had been there for killing lovers uh, gay lovers as well as, as, as male lovers. And the, they, were, they were granted parole because they had not had an opportunity to raise the kind of defense I'm describing, to raise battered women syndrome. And so they were granted parole not because it was right to do what they had done, but because they had been unable to present the full context. And so that might be an argument. It becomes very difficult uh, uh, it becomes very difficult to say this killing is justified, this is not, but to suggest that she had, didn't have the opportunity to present what is now commonplace, a battered woman syndrome, could be a basis for it. I can't predict what would happen. I can only tell you that that has happened before and was seen sort of an issue of procedural fairness, not allowing these women to, uh, 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 to, to be able to mount a battered woman syndrome defense. The other thing is that in the, um, the United States is not as attentive to the international, the pressures of the international community as they should be. And uh, we've only begun to see changes in American sentencing with the death penalty as a result of judges looking abroad and realizing that we are wrong in this. Uh, how that has percolated down to life imprisonment is another question. Sydney Taro, visiting from Cornell University and formerly from the Yale Political Science Department. Oh my. <laughs> and she was in my class in oh 1968. My. Oh, my. oh my. That's got, I can't, that's a long time ago. That's even more than, sh that's pre Shattuck. No, no, what, what you're supposed to say is show the drawing. <laughs> oh my. Well, you said you felt old, so. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, oh my. Judge Gertner, I'd like to ask if you can say something about the practice of indefinite detention of illegal um, combatants and whether you see a future for habeas corpus in the American court system. Well, I think I see a future for habeas corpus in the American court system, the difficulty becomes, um, you know, it's sort of like the answer to the other question, which is you can have a procedural right, but the question is whether or not individual judges will enforce it. The Supreme Court has said there's habeas relief, but the kinds of justifications that have passed muster in the courts of the United States, frankly, are not, should not pass muster. So. I think that it will be spotty is the answer. There will be some who will be released. There will be some who will not. Um, uh, but there certainly won't be a coherent trend. I can ask, tell you my personal point of view, but we get none of these cases. None of these cases go to Massachusetts at all. Typically, the cases are brought in the, case in the, in the jurisdictions where the government knows that the, that the outcome will be what they want. Habeas corpus is really an ancient uh, uh, writ, an ancient procedure that enables someone in custody uh, 
in, the cust in state custody to come to court to challenge the terms of their custody. Um, I get, for example, cases all the time of prisoners who are challenging state uh, convictions. I last week just released someone who was challenging his federal conviction, a federal conviction in front of me, uh, where he was charged with arson and the science, as I found out, did not support the charge. So he's in, he was in prison for 15 years. He was sentenced to 15 years. He'd only done four or five years. He brings a writ of habeas corpus in a federal court, and the writ of habeas corpus asks me to look at the legality of his detention, and I did, and right before I came here, I released him. Hi, I'm Linda Vadas. I live here in Budapest, but I was a resident of Worcester. Worcester. <laughs> and uh, West Hisbury. And I'm, I have a comment about an experience that I had serving on a jury in the District Court of Worcester, which I'm very ashamed of, actually. And I wonder how you deal with these kind of issues. Um, it was a case where, a criminal case where, um, I, I won't go into the details, but uh, we had to, you know, have a unanimous decision and uh, the, the, I felt that the, I was in the mi minority along with one other woman on the jury and uh, we were badgered into uh, caving in to a bully who was the jury foreman. Mm. And the judge was uh, pressuring us also to uh, come to a decision. And I walked out of the courtroom in tears, knowing that justice had not been served. And it was really one of the most shameful days of my life. And how do you, I, and I've resolved if I ever have to serve on another trial. In Massachusetts, we have one day or one trial. Everyone usually gets called at some point. Uh, that, that I won't cave in again, but as a judge, do you, do you, how do you deal with that kind of issue where you've, you um, might notice that the, um, because the jury has come back and said uh, we can't come to a decision, what kind of pressure do you put on them? I put, well, it, it, it's easy for me to answer that question because my experience as a trial lawyer on the other side of the bench made me recognize that when a jury can't come to a decision, it's a decision. It's a decision that the government hasn't met its burden of proof. So in fact, um, I stopped the proceedings, but you ought to write about that experience. You, you ought to write about that experience. You know, one of the things about my talk that I wanted to suggest is there's stuff that lawyers can do in court. There's stuff that judges can do as judges. There's stuff that citizens can do as citizens. And, and, and writing, particularly in this age of the internet, is something that's terribly important. The only people who write about jury service are those who are waxing poetic about it. It seems to me if you had a different experience, you ought to say that. And, and, and the courts, and there's, there should be no consequence to your saying that except that people will listen. So I encourage you to blog. <laughs> Here you go. Um, I'm Ellen Hume, and I've known you for 20 years. And this I'm is, at this <laughs> people have to stop putting numbers on I've known you. <laughs> and I'm at the Center for um, Media and Communication Studies here. And I have a question to follow up on your talk. You talked about how the battered women's syndrome became recognized as a factor in the courts. Well, that seems like progress to me. How did it come about that the male patronage courts of America became more female and became more used to things like battered women's syndrome? And to add on to that, how in the world did they start recognizing gay marriage? How did this kind of change occur within this court system? And, and how did you find levers to bring it about in your own way? I mean, I think people need some success stories and some mechanisms for change. Well, th those are, to some degree, those are two separate stories. The battered woman syndrome issue is partly a legal issue, but it's partly a media issue. It's partly a media issue. There was a spate of movies about women who were abused, public, popular movies about women who were abused, where these issues began to be discussed. It was on television, it was in the media, and suddenly an alternative, I, well, I hate to use this word, an alternative narrative came out which was not 
the narrative of these women deserve it or why didn't they leave, but exactly how oppressive that situation could be, why a woman perfectly, uh, uh, you know, normal woman could nevertheless fear leaving. So that, in part it was a media campaign, in part it was a blogging, not blogging in those days, but in part it was an op-ed campaign, and then the law reflected that, because even though I'm an independent judiciary, we're an independent judiciary, we want to be accountable to the public, and if social norms are changing, the courtroom should reflect that. Gay marriage is, a, is an entirely different and extraordinary success story. Um, the next generation, my sons and my daughter, 23, 25, and 37, um, are, have attitudes to gay marriage which are very different than my generation. And again, I don't think that that is a court issue. That was initially a media issue. They have simply grown up with this as legitimate. Um, and their attitudes have fundamentally changed. The court in that regard, to some degree, began to reflect those changes. There's a reciprocal relationship between a court and the public. And as attitudes change, lawyers then can refer to those attitudes in going to court, and judges can reflect those attitudes in their decisions, except I have to say as a footnote, um, we have a constitution and the Constitution has been interpreted over the years, uh, in my judgment, appropriately to reflect changes in our view of rights. Without a Constitution, that becomes more difficult, but the court still reflects society, and the things that are considered wrong change over time. But the gay marriage rule in Massachusetts was an advance of a general cultural approval of that, so how did they manage that? Well, uh, it, it, is an, it was a courageous set of judges that managed that, but our history is filled with situations in which the, the society begins to change, a judge or a, or a court, this time it was a full bench, begins to recognize that change and the society changes more. Brown versus Board of Education was a classic example of that. This was the case that announced that separate but equal was inherently unequal. In other words, it wasn't enough to say slavery was over, but we could have black schools and white schools, that this violated the Constitution. When the Supreme Court did that, there was an argument that they were slightly ahead of the society, but their having said that legitimized the concept, and after a while it became accepted more and more in the public. So that's what I mean by a reciprocal relationship. You're an independent judge, but that does not mean that I go off into the library and you know consider rules as a formality, I know I live in a context, in a community, in a society, and the laws reflect that to a degree. So before, um, before I turn to, to the next commenter, let me follow up on, on, on this question in a, or on this discussion, because we, we hear you talking a lot about sharing community experiences. This is a very diverse community where you come from with, with people with, with such backgrounds. Um, whom judges wouldn't know personally and wouldn't hear about except in this very formalized setting and, and usually on account of very unfortunate accusations or, and, or, or events. And you emphasize communication a lot and, and I, as if I, maybe I'm even hearing you saying that judges seem to have, if not an ethical, then a moral responsibility to inform the lawmaker when, when they didn't get it right, when the law is unreasonable, arbitrary, or just doesn't talk to reality. So what is it, mm -hmm. in, in your opinion, and, and that's gonna be the, may, maybe I'm wrong about no, no. this, but it, it sounds like this, and, and you seem to, seem to emphasize dialogue and communication uh, above many other things. So, of course, judges' minds can be opened with, with good arguments being presented in front of them in a compelling way. But what, what could be, on the basis of your many years of experience on, on the bench, that could open up not only the ears, but also the minds of judges towards patterns of arguments, towards narratives which are not the settled ones, which are not the usual mainstream stories about life. So what, what is it that a legal system can do to its independent judges to make them more receptive and, and more thinking forward and along the lines of a diverse, pluralistic society? We, we, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this tomorrow, but um, judges get trained. And uh, 
well, actually, let me talk prior to that. One of the things that we did in the United States, for example, when people were concerned about racial and gender disparities in court is all across the country, the courts sponsored gender and racial bias studies. And that meant that the courts would study themselves, not just outcomes, how may, look at how many times a woman will win in this kind of situation, look at damage awards, look at sexual harassment in the courthouses. And the results of those studies were widely distributed and training came from those studies. It was really quite eye-opening. In one court, for example, uh, uh, Puerto Rico, which is part of the United States, the, the gender har harassment complaints were enormous in the court itself. Small wonder then that the judges reflected a very different culture. And this was, it was quite eye-opening. So it has to be studying outcomes. Another professor from uh, Brooklyn Law School did a study of uh, employment discrimination outcomes in American court. How many times women are not, uh, women and minorities lose under circumstances that would be troubling. The statistics were quite extraordinary. And she circulated those statistics. Mm -hmm. If I sentenced people and someone told me that I was racist in my sentencing and said to me, you sentenced 100 people in a year and every time you had a black man, the sentence went up and gave me the statistics, it would move me. It would matter to me. It would affect what I did. So that studies circulated, training, are the way you affect the independent judiciary. Uh, this is Linda Fisher from Gender Studies Department. My background is in philosophy, and I have a more theoretical question. I wanted to ask you about the role of interpretation in law. <laughs> Especially from the point of view of the activity of the judge. You were mentioning earlier about the universality of law. and the process of perfecting or fine-tuning laws. But clearly, even with a more airtight law, it's a matter of the judge applying a law to a given case. And in that moment of application, I would say there has to be a necessary interpretation taking place of the law. And so the judge is always a kind of interpreter. And I think that some of the examples you gave were suggesting that interpretive activity of the judge. And particularly in the latter cases about the women and family circumstances. And so uh, perhaps you could comment on how you see the role of judge as interpreter of law. Um. That's a very important debate in the United States now, which is that we all recognize, or many of us recognize, that all laws are, all words are subject to a range of interpretations. The Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, more so than any other, since it was written as generally as it could be, precisely to deal with competing factions. <laughs> So of course the Constitution of the United States is capable of being uh, interpreted in many ways. A common law uh, judge, our Congress, for example, enacts laws that are oftentimes the product of compromise. And so the laws are frequently giving one thing in the opening clause and taking it away and the closing clause are subject to interpretation. And in any event, as scholars know, words are 
don't interpret themselves. Words need to be interpreted. What does one do as a judge with respect to that? Well, this may be a, a process answer. First, it makes it so important to have interpreters who are diverse, who have, can bring to the, to the bench all the context of the human condition, so that it's not simply the, the interpreters of one race or ethnic group or religion. That's one thing. And the other is there clearly are um, a range of interpretations for words, and there are things that are outside the range and things that are within it. And there's an appellate process that attempts to determine what is within the range and what is not. But you're quite right. Um, just because I write something on a piece of paper, one has to bring, bring a context to it. And you deal with the context through the diversity of the bench. You deal with the context through the appellate process. You deal with the context to some degree by the kind of reciprocal relationship with the public that we have uh, to a degree. But battered human syndrome was a classic example of a context that, the, that I'm convinced that the numbers of women in the legal profession helped to bring forward. The issue had not even been raised prior to that. So that's part of, that's part of an answer. And finally, for the last comment, let me give the floor to Judge Levy from the Hungarian Thank you. Uh, my name is Miklos Levy. I am a member of uh, the Constitutional Court of Hungary. So in your presentation and in your response to Renata's uh, question, you mentioned how the training is important. I mean training against racist or discriminative attitude in the criminal justice system. Could you give us examples about uh, training programs for police officers or for, for judges? Or is there or are there any special training uh, programs uh, at the law schools for law students against racism and uh, discrimination attitude or, or, or aspects? I have brochures. <laughs> <laughs> I have piles of brochures. I have, I have time. Yes, <laughs> do you want, I have brochures. No, I mean, I think that uh, uh, we, have, we teach by hypotheticals in the American law schools. And so you take a police officer and you, you, you give him a hypothetical and you show to him, um, you, this is much like the Stewart case I described. Well, there are two narratives here. Why did you choose one? Why didn't you choose the other? What's the impact of your choosing one? What's the impact of your choosing one uncritically? Uh, what are the alternative explanations? And you do that in concrete uh, cases. And then in the case of, for example, battered women, because that's what we're talking about, people needed to learn that if a woman stayed with her batterer, it didn't mean uh, that she was consenting to being battered. It meant that she, did, she felt he had no choice. And so people had to learn about a world that they knew nothing about. And, had to, and it was easier to learn about it out of the context of an individual case, because then you could talk about it more generally. But we have training programs for police officers. My husband actually is working on one for the Boston police because their arrest figures seem to be racially skewed. Uh, the Federal Judicial Conference and the, Na and the um, National Center for State Courts have training programs for judges, um, and, uh, and, I've, and the law schools also have training programs. But the training program can't be abstraction, can't be people wagging their finger at you and saying, don't discriminate. It has to be, um, as I've talked about in China, you, there would be a law that would say, uh, sexual harassment is bad. Do not sexually harass. Then you'd have a cut, you'd give uh, them an example. What if the boss said, if you don't sleep with me, you won't get a raise? And some man in one of my classes said, what's the problem with that? <laughs> uh, and so it was clear there was a complete disconnect between the abstract principle and the concrete example. And you had to teach by concrete examples. Thank you very much for teaching new lessons to everyone. Thank you for Thank the you. questions. And